So I'm gonna uh, go ahead, we're at 531, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. If we got our, there's a red blinking light. That means we're ready? Okay, all right. All right, <clears throat> good evening everyone. Uh, this is the October 26, 2020 edition of the Moorhead City Council meeting. And it is 5.31 p.m. I will turn to Madam Clerk for a roll call, please. Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson-Curry. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Deb White. Here. Larry Seljavold. Here. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Steve Lindos. Here. And in council, acting city manager Dan Molly, and also on the line is Katie Birch from Onstead Twitchell, and Mayor Jonathan Judd. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If you can please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Mayor Jonathan Judd. The Moorhead City Council is holding its regularly scheduled meeting using virtual meeting technology under an emergency declaration due to COVID-19. I am in the City Council chambers with the city, acting city manager <clears throat> and the city clerk and a few other staff members. Council members are attending remotely. Any public comment received prior to, to this meeting will be read as a part of, of the record during the applicable agenda item. The public may participate during the meeting by calling 218-299-5001. Public input will be taken by a staff member and provided to me to read during the meeting. Or you may request that your call be bridged to the virtual WebEx meeting and speak directly during our public hearings or citizens addressing the council agenda item. Again, the public comment line is 218-299-5001. If there is not an answer, please leave your message or callback number and a member of our staff will get back to you as soon as possible. And with that, we'll move on to item number three <clears throat> on the agenda. Are there any amendments to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I thought I might, somebody was trying to say something. Uh, we move on to item number four, consent agenda. Are there any items that were removed from consent at Consent Manager Molly? There are none, Mayor. Okay. Hearing seeing none, is there a motion to con to approve the consent agenda? Duran, so moves. Linda, second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Watson Curry. Yes. White. Yes. Durand. Yes. Hendrickson. Aye. Lindos. Yes. Seljavold. Aye. Motion is approved. Then we'll move on to item number five on the agenda, recognitions, presentations, 5A presentation from Cass Clay Food Partners. And I'll pass it over to Acting City Manager Molly. Thank you, Mayor. As we kind of, I don't know if you call this the harvest season, but this is what it is. Uh, the, uh, uh, we've uh, and asked the Class uh, Clay Food Partners to join us to give us an update on uh, what the, the blueprints and the plan look like. But uh, as we get into that, I want to uh, introduce, we have a, um, just a really incredibly bright, diligent, and hardworking intern, Gabrielle Lomel, who helps with a lot of our sustainability, renewable initiative initiatives, energy efficiency uh, sort of work. Uh, she works with our Green Step Cities program. She's done 
a lot of, of, of work with our um, a public works team around recycling. And uh, one of the things she took on this year was gardening in Moorhead and partnered with a few organizations in the community and did some really fantastic work. So she was gonna share that with us. And then um, on the back side of that, uh, Kim Lepesky from Fargo Cass Public Health and Rory Beal from uh, the Public Health in Clay County. Um, uh, is, uh, is, is on board to, uh, to share the plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gabrielle. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dan, and thank you everybody for having me. Um, I'm just gonna share my presentation. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see it? Awesome. Okay. Okay, so for those of you that I haven't met before, um, I'm Gabrielle Lummel. I just graduated from Concordia this spring and I'm currently interning with the city. And I also was hired as the Moorhead Community Garden Coordinator for the summer, which is why I'm here this evening to give a brief update on my work. So this is a part-time position funded by the Moorhead Community Resilience Task Force. And the purpose was to strengthen and expand community gardening efforts in Moorhead. So we currently have three community gardens. We have the Grateful Garden at First Presbyterian Church. We have the Riverview Garden at Moorhead Public Housing. And then we have the Bridgepoint Community Garden at Bridgepoint Community Church. Oops. Okay, these community gardens provide many benefits for our community, making it important that the city finds synergistic ways to support them. So one of these benefits is increased food security in our community. Um, a lot of the produce grown at these gardens is donated. Um, the Grateful Garden donates most of their produce to the Dorothy Day House and the Dorothy Day Food Pantry. The Riverview Garden donates most of their produce to the residents that live in the High Rise Building at Moorhead Public Housing. And then the Bridgepoint Community Church has a food pantry located in the church where they bring a lot of their produce. Another benefit is that community gardens provide land access and a shared responsibility in growing food. Um, a lot of people don't have access to their own yard or land to grow food on, and it can also be overwhelming or too time consuming for one person to do it all themselves. All these community gardens meet just once per week for two hours and with enough volunteers, that's plenty of time to get everything done for the week. And then the last benefit I have listed is community involvement. Um, community gardens bring people together from all different parts of the community, and it's a great way to make connections with people that you might not, might not have met otherwise. And then some updates on the Grateful Garden. So back in May, we doubled the size of this garden and it went from 800 square feet to 1600 square feet. And then we also built raised beds to prevent the flooding that they usually experience. And then the volunteer coordinator at this garden and I also did some outreach in the surrounding neighborhood. We distributed flyers. Um, and then I'm also currently working with Office Sign Company in Fargo to have a sign made for the garden. And this is gonna convey the history, the mission, and how the garden works. Um, and then people walking by will be able to see that it's a community garden and that they're invited to join. And then some updates at the Riverview Garden. So we also doubled the size of this one last month. It went from 1,800 square feet to 3,600 square feet. And then using additional funds from the Community Resilience Task Force, we also contracted with Tyler Franklin to help with the garden expansion. He is the um, garden and high tunnel manager at Concordia, and he did the tilling, he taught us how to build raised beds, and he also built a nice eight foot fence to keep the deer out, because there's a lot of deer in that area by the river. Um, and then I'm also in the process of having a sign made for this garden too, which is gonna be really similar to the one at the Grateful Garden. And then there are also plans to hold a seed starting event for the residents in the high rise at Moorhead Public Housing to get them involved in the garden in the spring. And then a few additional updates. So I started the Moorhead Fargo Community Garden Network on Facebook, which is a space for gardens, volunteers, and the larger community to connect and share knowledge and resources. They can promote their volunteer opportunities and things like that. And then Noelle Hardin and I from Cass Clay Food Partners, um, along with a few others, also met with the local foods coordinator in Bismarck to learn about her position and to see if we could get something similar started in Moorhead. Her position is funded through a partnership between the city of Bismarck, Bismarck Parks and Rec, and the public school district. 
It's a part-time position and it's focused on the community orchard, the farm to school program and the local farmers market. Um, and then I just wanna mention how helpful Noel and Cascade Food Partners have been throughout the summer. Noel has been my mentor and I've learned so much from her and the Cascade Food Partners Network has really helped to boost the Moorhead Fargo Community Garden Network when I started that. So thank you to them. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot of community interest in joining community gardens and there's also interest in starting additional gardens. In so the Probesfield Gardens in North Moorhead will not be reopening after this season, which means that as many as 50 gardeners may be looking for new places to grow food. Um, and then additionally, I was invited to speak to the Bethesda Lutheran Church Council members last month because um, they're really interested in starting a community garden. Um, but ultimately they were concerned that there won't be enough support, which leads me to my final slide where I wanna touch on a few recommendations of things the city could do to support these gardens. Um, so the easiest thing for the city to do to get involved with them is to help promote them. So we could do this through the city insights publishings that come out twice per year. We could publish community garden information on the city's website, and then we could also send out e-notifications about them. Um, and then I also recommend that we consider a position similar to the local foods coordinator one in Bismarck, and this could be a partnership between the city, Cascade Food Partners, and a few other local organizations. Um, and then this is a really great time to start looking into a position like this because we have identified local foods as one of the metrics that we want to focus on through the city's Green Step Cities program. Um, and this position would really give our Green Step City status a boost in the community. And then lastly, I would recommend that you address local food in the upcoming comprehensive planning process, which Cascade Food Partners is going to have more information on tonight. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lomel, for your work. And good to see you again. Uh, for those at home, uh, Gabrielle was also uh, an intern uh, for the uh, mayor's office as well. So was, uh, she did an excellent job in that capacity as well. So thank you, Gabrielle, for your, uh, your great work. Thank you, Mayor John. So with that, do we have any uh, questions or comments? And if it's all right with you, Mayor, perhaps we could just roll right into the Food Partners presentation. Absolutely. Kim, Rory, we'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Dan, council members for having us this evening. Um, I'm Rory Beal. I'm the Health Promotion Director for Clay County Public Health. And I am Kim Lepetsky. I am a co-chair for the Cass Clay uh, Food Partners, and I work as a public health nutritionist for Fargo Cass Public Health. I'm also a Moorhead resident. So we had sent over some slides and I think, there you go. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Okay, so for our presentation this evening, Rory and I are gonna be addressing three areas. Uh, first, we plan to share some information regarding our local food system. Second, we will uh, provide a little background regarding the Cascade Food Partners, including uh, who we are and what our work entails. And then third, discuss what we see as opportunities to partner and work with Moorhead on food systems issues. Next slide. Okay, so when we talk about food systems, I think it's important to keep in mind that a food system encompasses multiple areas. This graphic is a simplified version of a food system. Starting at the top of the cycle, you have grow, where we are, where we're talking about food production, such as farming, gardening, animal production, and so forth. As we move around the cycle, there's processing, the art of taking that food and turning it into a consumable product if needed. Distribution addresses the transportation aspect, moving the food to places where consumers can access it through direct services like farmers markets or places such as grocery stores. Get deals with how consumers access food. Um, do all residents have easy access to healthy food choices and options? Make, do consumers know how to prepare food? Teaching food skills and providing education on how to cook fall into this area. Eat, where do we eat? At home, in restaurants, at school, and are there healthy choices available at those places? Are hunger and food insecurity an issue? 
And then composting and disposal, the items at the end of the cycle. By composting, we're able to nourish the soil for the growth of future food so the, so the cycle can start over again. And for food disposal, looking at ways to prevent food waste and promoting uh, food recovery efforts. So next slide. And this is kind of hard to see, but I do like this graphic because it illustrates the multiple factors that can have an impact on food. And we consider these factors as well when we talk about our food system. So it shows the broader systems such as health, economics, political, social, and biological systems, all which play a role in our food system. For example, when we address food production, not only are we looking at what is being produced, but also if that food production is ecologically friendly, what chemicals are being used, is it a sustainable system and so on. What are the food regulations and do we have a safe food supply? Uh, land use comes into play. If we wanna grow our own food, do zoning laws and ordinances allow us to do so? Then there's social justice issues. Do all residents have enough food and enough money to buy quality healthful foods? And does every citizen have transportation to get to the grocery store? Plus, what impact does the food we eat have on health, obesity, and chronic disease? So our food system is, is multifaceted with a number of different areas that are all intertwined and all are considered and addressed when we talk about our local food system. Next slide. So when, when we look at our local food systems, um, first of all, when this began several years ago, um, the two jurisdictions that house public health, the city of Fargo and Clay County, um, combined to help create this movement. And, and obviously, Kim works in public health, I do, and so health is certainly one of the prominent areas of focus. And when we look at um, Clay County, we know that right now about one in 10 residents are food insecure. And if, if that's not a term that you're familiar with, that simply means that people are not having easy access. One in 10 don't have easy access to food or they simply worry about when their next um, access to the foods, the desirable foods for them will be. Um, will be adult obesity in Clay County is 28%. If you look at um, overweight too, more than half of our county is above a healthy weight status and mental health indicators certainly are, are things that we can improve upon as well. And we believe that the, that the local food system has a role in this. Next slide. And hunger as well is, is one of the areas that uh, our work would like to focus on and, and address. Um, food insecurity and emergency food use during COVID are both spiking. The Great Plains Food Bank reports a 44% increase at food shelves and almost 80% increase at mobile food distributions. And that photo is from a mobile, a mobile food shelf locally, Ruby's Pantry. So health, hunger, next slide, please. And we would like to help, help have a positive impact on local food economics. We've got our traditional uh, food retailers, grocery and restaurant, which are certainly an upheaval in this current time with, with changing purchasing patterns during COVID, um, supply chain disruptions, restaurant closings. Um, so we want to be able to help create an environment that helps to um, make that more sustainable and, and resilient, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, there's efforts to support local farmers markets, which are certainly uh, increasingly thriving. Farm to table programs where our local schools purchase from local growers to be part of the uh, school school lunch program. And then there are non-traditional pieces um, with looking at home gardening, things individuals can do for themselves, food preservation, um, and then things beyond the individual where folks may be looking at how can they be um, urban farmers and maybe looking at opportunities to be business owners. Next slide, please. And the fourth piece, we've got health, hunger, economics, and now resilience. And certainly um, we wanna be part of creating a system that is there to provide easy, healthy, accessible foods in all circumstances during all times. And one of the things that stands out is the work that you've done as a city to 
to adopt the resolution about green steps back in 2017. And, and we look at things like um, it addresses supporting home or community gardens, animal husbandry, and incorporation of food production in residential areas, creating and assisting with promoting local food production and distribution within the city. And so we'd like to have a role with the city to help make an especially resilient, a more resilient food system. Next slide. And we have a, an interesting, I think a fun story, a success story in, in the fargo Morehead area. And um, Gabrielle, Gabrielle talked about community gardens. There's been a group uh, that, that has labeled itself Growing Together. It started out of a uh, Lutheran church in South Fargo now maybe 15 years ago to, to help connect with new Americans who happen to have a, agricultural backgrounds and, and they wanted to help these folks get connected in our communities, but also to use some of the skills that they brought over from their home countries. And so now there are more than 100 um, new Americans who are gardening with this Growing Together group. And out of that group, some expert gardeners have stepped forward and are now part of what's called New Roots Farm Incubator. I saw Verna Cragness is on this call. She helps lead this effort, which is to really help identify and train new potential urban farmers to coach them, to help them develop business plans so they can ultimately maybe become business owners and be successful. And so we've seen a nice progression from community gardens to some individuals who are now striving to start their own businesses. And so um, our local food system is uh, is vital to the health of our communities. And, and our hope is that Moorhead will continue to support that and, and grow its support. Next slide. Okay. So one of the networks in our community that's been working on, uh, working to address some of these local food systems issues over the years has been the, the Cascade Food Partners. So next slide. Uh, the Cascade Food Partners are a network of organizations and uh, local residents that are working to build a strong, healthy, and vibrant food system with a mission to improve all levels of our community food system to assure that residents of Cass and Clay County have access to safe, nutritious, affordable, and culturally based food. And we included our values on the bottom of that slide too, just for, for your reference. Next. There are three arms to our network. We have a steering committee that oversees the work of the network. We have the Cascade Food Commission, which deals with food systems policy related issues. And then the Cass Clay Food Action Network, which is also known as First Fridays at B. This is our community engagement arm. Next slide. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna briefly touch on a couple of key points on this slide. But one of them is that our group has been in existence for a long time. We formed over 10 years ago. In the early years, uh, MetroCog, who is one of our network partners, was instrumental in working with the group to develop the region's first food systems plan. The first recommendation in that plan was to form a food council. So then in 2015, a food council was formed, and it's currently known as the Cascade Food Commission. It consists of 12 members. It has 17 that, or, or I'm sorry, seven that are elected officials from local jurisdictions and five at-large food systems experts. And this group works to address policy relating um, to our local food system. We reorganized and rebranded ourselves in 2017. And then in 2018, we worked with another one of our partners, Food of the North, to form the community engagement branch of the network. Next slide. Okay. So over the years, the partners have been involved in a lot of different work, but we wanted to kind of focus on a couple of our policy related accomplishments. And one of those includes the creation of 20 uh, food policy documents we refer to as blueprints and snapshots. These are basically research documents that have background information and ordinance and policy recommendations to consider. Should a city or a county decide to move a particular food system issue forward in, in their jurisdiction? So these documents include topics such as residential gardening, backyard chicken keeping, composting, food and hunger, um, hunger and food insecurity, um, pollinator habitats, gleaning, 
pesticide use on public land and so on. And you can find these on our website, cascladefoodpartners.com under the resources tab. If you wanna take a, a look at those, but we have 20 of those documents um, that are available for use. We also um, are available to help local jurisdictions in moving a particular food related policy or ordinance forward. An example of our work is, has been with the city of Fargo in the approval of a backyard chicken keeping ordinance in the spring of 2017. We utilize the research in our backyard chicken keeping blueprint document to assist with drafting ordinance language. Then we helped to hold some public input meetings and assisted with uh, education, community-wide education on the topic and so on. Another recent accomplishment has been uh, our COVID-19 response. Uh, the fact that we already have a network in place really helped in our rapid response to food-related issues that the pandemic has brought about. When the pandemic hit, the uh, Food Partner Steering Committee and the Cast Clay Food Commission members began to meet weekly to uh, discuss potential solutions to food-related issues that were arising in our community due to COVID. We were also able to get two temporary policies related to urban agriculture passed in Fargo. And we were also able to provide uh, rapid information sharing. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of examples of the information sharing that we did um, and are still doing. We pulled together a community resource list. Uh, we created a frequently asked question guide on urban agriculture. With the pandemic going on, a lot of people have been very interested in growing their own food. And there's been a lot of questions as to what is allowed and not allowed in the different jurisdictions. So we pulled together a guide that answered questions such as, can I garden in my yard? What about on my boulevard? Can I keep chickens and so on? Uh, in addition, a variety of our network partners hosted 45 Facebook Live updates. Next slide. This slide is just a sampling of, of the many partners that conducted the, the Facebook Live videos, a few of the topics that we covered, and then the number of residents that viewed these particular videos. But with these particular videos, there was anywhere from 400 to 800 residents and over that, that viewed them. Next slide. Okay. So as far as the Cass Clay Food Partners Network, we can support jurisdictions in a number of different ways with policy research and recommendations, with ordinance development, um, interpretation and implementation across jurisdictions. The nice thing about having partners um, who represent a number of different cities and counties is that we can learn from one another. And when we adopted the temporary Boulevard Garden Policy in Fargo this spring, we were able to model that policy off of what Moorhead has for their Boulevard Garden Program. Um, we can also help communities address pressing food systems related issues that come about. The COVID response uh, is an example of this. Next slide. Okay, so for the last part, um, what has the food partners relationship been with Moorhead and where do we see the opportunities moving forward? Next. So Moorhead has had representation on the Food Commission since 2015 and we'd like to thank both Heidi Duran and Sarah Watson Curry for their, their service on the commission over the years. Uh, city staff worked with us to provide clarification on existing regulations in response to COVID. So thanks to Josh Hoffman, Robin Houston, the engineering department and others for helping us with this. And the Cass Clay Food Partners currently has three steering committee members on Moorhead's Resilience Task Force. Next. Okay. So looking forward with Sarah leaving the, the city council, uh, we, we will be looking to the council to appoint a member to represent Moorhead on the Cass Clay Food Commission in 2021. Um, we also feel Moorhead has a lot of great things going on as a city right now, including the vision of resiliency and sustainability and all of which have a tie to food and, and food systems. So this presents the opportunity to work together, to explore the research that's already be, been done in the blueprint documents and the um, snapshot documents and potentially identify areas for change. 
And on that same note, um, our work with local food systems aligns really nicely with the Green Step City strategies and our network partners can be a resource for that program as well. Next. So um, I don't know how much time we have for questions, but we did include our uh, contact information, both I and Lori's on there. So feel free if you have questions um, to reach out to us and We'd like to thank you again for your time uh, and this opportunity to be here today. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Ms. Lepetsky and uh, Mr. Beal for your presentation. Um, I guess I'll open up to questions and I see Council Member White has her hand up. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Lepetsky and, and Mr. Beal. I, I really appreciate you coming here and sharing this information with us. It's so important. Um, I agree with the suggestion that we this is should be something that we look at when we talk about our comprehensive plan but even in this you know in the uh, immediate future it's just um with everything that we've seen going on in our community in our country and around the world it's it's um something that we really need to be talking about more and of course it, it is an equity issue that we know that that um the access to healthy food is is very unevenly distributed and so I, I would love to hear a little bit more about any suggestions you have. For, so my two questions are one, um, as you've really you know, explored differences between different communities and some of the challenges that we've had, what do you see as some of the barriers that we have here in Moorhead? And also what do you see, uh, what would be some of your suggestions for changes in regard to policies or ordinance? And in particular, things that we might do even um, in the short term, because you know what we're facing right now in our community with the um, you know uh, the global pandemic uh, and the economic crisis, it's not going away anytime soon, and so we can expect to see growing issues with um, food insecurity and health concerns. And so I think if there are things that we can do to make sure that we can build that resiliency, and as we're going into our you know next year's growing season, that we're planning ahead and doing things to that we might even do some immediate things to help people um, have better access to healthy food. So I'd love to hear those two things, your thoughts on some of the barriers and some possible um, suggestions for changes in particular things that we could do um, soon. Well, I can address, I'll, I'll address that second part um, to, to start off with, but we, when we started getting together, especially with our, our Cass Clay Food Commission, we said, what, what do we want to do? And um, <clears throat> one of those things that came up is, is doing some of that research and some of that background information and creating these blueprints so that when a jurisdiction is ready to go and ready to take a look at um, what are some things that they might want to address and move forward with, all of that research is there. And in those blueprint documents, they have background um, background information, why you would consider this. It also has, you know, economic and health um, indicators and, and implementations by doing these things. What some of the other jurisdictions are doing locally in here, as well as what other jurisdictions, places like Sioux Falls and, um, and places around Nebraska, what are they doing to, um, to, to deal with some of these issues? So I think one of the first steps would be to, um, to, to have staff from the city of Moorhead meet with some of our uh, food partners and, and take a look at what are those blueprint documents, what are in them, what are something that we can uh, take a look at in Moorhead as far as, as moving some of these things forward. Because the research is there, the information is there, and we've got plenty of food partners that would be willing to take that next step and help Moorhead move forward with some of those things. Um, and like I said, we've got 20 different topics and a, a lot of interested people in, in working on this, so. Well, I would just echo, I would just echo that I think there's will, that intentionality is probably what's the, is the need um, now. And um, so we're, we're ready and waiting. Great, thank you, uh, Council Member White. And then um, I'll pass it over to Council Member Lindos and then Council Member Watson Curry. 
Hey, Premier Jeff. I was actually don't have as much a question, although I, I um, support what Councilmember White just said. Um, I was going to actually ask uh, Acting Manager Dan Molly a question, but I'll let Councilmember Watson Creek go first then. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilmember Watson Curry. And just for those, uh, we do have one caller in, and then uh, uh, Acting City Manager Molly is going to provide a synopsis of what the city is going to be involved in. So just in case anyone has any questions related to that, uh, Mr. Molly's going to back clean up and, and <laughs> tell everybody about that. So Councilmember Watson Curry. Phew, it's good to know Dan's got is taken care of. <laughs> um, I wanted to say thanks to Gabrielle too. Um, I, I don't know if we got to hear why, but I was concerned to hear that Probesfield won't be offering, um, that those garden spaces won't be um, utilized next year. That's my first place that I cut my teeth as a gardener and mostly just grew wild spinach or weeds. Um, it makes me think uh, historically, um, if you've ever attended the Victory Garden display at the MCOMST, um, they talk about putting pressure on the city to not, um, during World, World War II and the Victory Garden era, to not have slacker land. And um, I always think my grandma would always mourn when we would dig into this beautiful soil and um, turn it over from farmland into a development that, that would never return. So we have an abundance of this resource. And so seeing the community gardens expand is really, wonderful to see. Um, so thanks to everyone that participated in that and it's great to see those footprints grow. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, and maybe this has been noted already, but um, the, the Cass Clay Food Systems uh, master plan is actually incorporated within the city of Moorhead strategic plan. So it's already nested inside something that we reference annually, um, much like the river corridor plan or other things that we look at and holistically try to approach. So um, we've talked and these things, the blueprints and other topics do come up and percolate organically in the community. Um, it would be really fantastic to um, start earmarking some of them and working towards addressing and incorporating some of these. Uh, in the last couple months, I, you know, so many um, comments and conversations about pollinator habitats and um, obviously food too, um, it's all tied together. I feel like there has been a large shift in kind of the philosophy on, you know, what gardens or park spaces need to look like. So I, I really, um, I feel some weight and pull towards the, the, some of those um, topics. But anyway, I just wanted to say that it is incorporated within our strategic plan. And so I would love to push, pull, or cheer for um, enacting some of those things. And if it gets incorporated, great. And if not, then um, the Cass Clay Food Partners has that reference as well. So thanks everyone for your great work and whoever gets the next to appointed to it, it is um, a fabulous group and I always learn so much. So thank you all for your work. Thank you, uh, Council Member Watson Curry. Uh, unless there's any other council members that have any questions or comments, uh, we do have a uh, caller uh, that would like to uh, talk to the council on this agenda item. Uh, and I believe, Madam City Clerk, that's uh, Ms. Uh, Verna Kragnes. We agree. So what we'll do, are you there, uh, Ms. Kragnes? Hello? I think I got it figured out. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to join this conversation. And um, again, I have such appreciation as a new in the last five years or so a resident of Moorhead for all the wonderful work that's been done and by the commitment on the part of the city. Um, and I just wanted to um, both underscore and affirm how important this work is the topics of resiliency and food access and food system um, because it, it connects to a place to live. What we have to eat is so incredibly important, but more so than how is that food produced and brought to us and 
done in environmentally sound ways. So the question of sustainability is also critical as well. I work as executive director now for Northern Plains Sustainable Agriculture Society, which is a farmer member organization that's focused on sustainability. Our members are in Minnesota, North and South Dakota, um, Northern Nebraska, Eastern Montana, and a few in Canada. And uh, two years ago, we brought our conference to Fargo for the first time in a number of years. Prior to that, it had been for many years in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Um, and basically, one of the things that has been mentioned already, which um, is uh, an expression of the support for uh, beginning farmers that we're launching here in this community and hope to replicate in other communities, is the New Roots Farm Incubator Cooperative. And this is, is really an, an important um, work from the point of view of um, Northern Plains support for beginning farmers and creating farm access, and especially in this time of heightened awareness about um, equity and justice in our world in, in this country. Um, just to note that um, in Minnesota, 84.10% of the population uh, farmers are white. But in terms of um, the number of farmers who own land, it's 99% um, of the white farmers own land, and the rest do not own land. So basically, uh, wealth building pathways, as was described from um, new uh, residents to the Fargo-Moorhead area who have skills and a passion for farming, being able to then move through a concrete uh, program and path that has created land access for them, technical support for those areas that they need support, recognizing that it provides a potential pathway for developing a, a business um, and eventually land ownership is really a significant uh, social justice work that our organization is accomplishing along with the support of um, a strengthening of the school system and strengthening of, um, of the local economy. I want to also share in terms of um, one of the reasons that all of this work is so important um, related to the local economy I was privileged as a small-scale farmer a number of years ago to be involved in some research um, in the, the Twin Cities food shed and the University of Wisconsin at River Falls. And um, if you think of the multiplier effect, which means that if you, um, if you spend a dollar and how much it cycles around the community, that the average uh, rural consumer, which I think even though Moorhead is a city <laughs> in Fargo, um, our residents here, many are coming from the surrounding rural areas, and um, it cycles only 1.6 times the dollar that the consumer spends in the local economy, according to the studies done. And um, larger scale farms cycle 1.5 more with the dollars that are spending on and so on. But by the small in this particular they were cycling 2.3 times through the local economy. And you can start to say, well, how can that be when tractors on large farms are $500,000? And um, it's because maybe what's needed for a small-scale farm is a spade from your local hardware store and other things that are more locally available. And so the economic... Uh, and social justice benefits to the approach to the kind of beginning farmer training and food system work that um, we're happy to be a part of in this community. Um, are there any questions? Oh, and I did post, um, we were recently privileged to be featured as one of the farms um, interviewed by the um, Minnesota Farm to School 
uh, programs. So there were more than 30 classrooms in Minnesota that tuned in on Thursday to um, an interview of some of the New Roots farmers. And there's a YouTube presentation with uh, the farmers speaking for themselves about um, their leadership role in New Roots, what their farm is to them, and what uh, their goals and hopes are for the future. And I would really hope um, that you could take time, uh, some time to take a look at that. Um, I've been grateful for having conversations with Gabrielle's help and with uh, the city of Moorhead. We're working on eventually bringing a proposal for the possibility of leasing land from Moorhead for um, another new roots incubator farm because we currently have a lease for only two more years at a site just north of Dilworth. Uh, we had um, 11 farmers this last year, and uh, one of them wants a slightly less amount of land, and all the rest want an expanded amount of land. So we are growing, and a growing interest. We have a number of additional people that like, would like to be involved. Okay. And um, so I'll stop there and see if there are questions. And I thank you for this opportunity to be part of the encouragement of the work that's being done in this local food system concept here in the Fargo-Moorhead area. And we uh, also thank you for your work as well, Ms. Cragness. I know that this is uh, something that you are very passionate about as well, uh, also working with uh, Ruby's Pantry as well through uh, First Congregational UCC. So, uh, so really, uh, really grateful to have you uh, as a resident in our city uh, celebrating this work. Also, thank you to uh, Mr. Beal and uh, Ms. Lepinski, Lepesky, sorry, for uh, sharing that information with our residents as well. I will, unless council has any other questions or comments, I will hand this over back to Mr. Molly so he can uh, also talk a little bit about what the uh, city is doing in this regard. So, Mr. Molly. Super, thanks, Mayor. Uh, so I, I just wanna just say there's some really uh, great recommendations uh, that came out of the, the presentation. There's a lot of excitement around uh, this um, at, the time, at this time. And so as far as aligning strategies and taking these recommendations forward, um, what I wanted to offer up was, you know, I'm happy to ask staff to research each of the blueprint items in this master plan, align them to Moorhead's ordinances and where we are at and feedback to the council uh, that information as far as whether they're in progress, underway, uh, in development, and a description of each. And in addition to that, we can take that information, place it on our website, um, on our city insights, in parks catalogs, and on e-notifications, social media, and other sources to get that information out. And as we get into the strategic plan and comprehensive planning processes, we'll also maybe identify some way to uh, uh, prioritize uh, some of these and, and uh, continue the work together. So. Thanks for the great information tonight. And thank you as well, uh, Mr. Molly. Uh, I'm assuming, so uh, does council have any uh, questions or comments regarding what Mr. Molly just spoke of? I do see Councilmember Member Lindos, your hand is up. So I, I guess um, would uh, uh, Acting City Manager Molly appreciate some head nods from council that this, this would be um, uh, something we'd like to see? If so, I'm, I'm nodding my head yes. Certainly, yes. All right. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you folks for the uh, information and for your work. And uh, unless there's any other comments or questions, we'll move on to the next agenda item. All right, so that brings us to uh, agenda item number six, the approval of the minutes from the October 12th, uh, 2020 minutes. Everybody's had an opportunity to review these minutes within the agenda packet. I'll look for a motion to approve. So move, Carlson. Linda Ossel, second. Motion's made and seconded. Any further comments, discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist? Yes. Watson Curry? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Durand? Yes. White? Yes. Seljibold? Hendrickson? 
Aye. Lindos. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, item number seven, citizens addressing the council. Um, I'll turn to Acting City Manager Molly, Madam City Clerk. Any citizens that wish to be heard? There are none, Mayor. None, none received by phone, email, any correspondence? Nope. All right. Then that moves us to our first pu public hearing, <clears throat> agenda item number nine, public hearing regarding Enclave Housing Redevelopment Project, the establishment of TIF district and redevelopment plan and TIF plan for tax increment financing, housing district number 29, 8th Street Redevelopment Project. Is there a motion to take us into public hearing? Lindos moves going to public hearing. Second, Chuck. Motion's made and seconded. Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist. Yes. Watson Curry. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Durand. Yes. White. Yes. Seljevold. Aye. Hendrickson. Aye. Lindos. Yes. Motion passes. We are in public hearing. Mr. LaPointe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very excited to bring you forward a project here that uh, I think has the ability to really transform a, a major corridor in our community. Um, Enclave uh, is the developer on this one, and Brian Bachman is on the phone if you have any specific questions to him after I give my presentation. Uh, a couple things I just want to outline tonight. You have two separate uh, items on the public hearing tonight. First is the establishment of the TIF district and plan, uh, which I'll kind of give a general overview of. And then secondly is the zoning amendment that uh, Robin Houston will uh, briefly touch on as well as a part of this uh, project. So with this project, as uh, was introduced a few weeks ago, this is a uh, mixed use development but we're specifically looking at the housing aspect of it. This is a greenfield site that's uh, uh, sandwiched between the Muscatel Subaru campus, uh, as I'll describe it, and uh, some of the existing commercial, which is the CVS and the bank and the Dairy Queen in that area. Um, we're looking at a, a creation of a housing TIF district, which would just be that greenfield site and a little bit of the existing uh, pavement in the commercial side. That district would be created to uh, make a housing project of about 127 units. Per state statute for housing TIF creation or TIF districts, there is an affordable housing component, which means um, at least 20% of the units will be restricted for occupancy by persons or families with incomes no greater than 50% of the area median income. And the developer has uh, agreed to um, accommodate that, which is equates to about 25 or so units uh, of that affordable uh, component of the 127 total units. Uh, we got really creative with this uh, program, and I should mention that TIF, TIF has a lot of steps with it in, uh, in Minnesota statute. Uh, so there's a lot of working parts with it. We're working very closely with our legal team, uh, so uh, city attorney's office, as well as utilizing a TIF consultant firm, which is Baker Tilly. Uh, Baker Tilly provided a lot of the, the documents that you see before us uh, tonight. Uh, they are the experts in, in TIF and kind of know really the, the process through and through. So we rely on them uh, quite a bit through this process to, to get creative and figure out how we uh, best serve the developer's needs as well as protecting the city's interest as well. Uh, with that, we looked at a couple different options and, uh, and really it, it came down to creating this housing district, maximizing the term on that, and some of that increment then helps with the commercial uh, development that will happen to the west of this housing project. Uh, that commercial component uh, has a variety of different inputs on it. Uh, at this point in time, I'll just note that uh, the developer can't get into any any um, specifics of the commercial just based on uh, some of the confidentiality with tenants and, and future prospects of tenants so uh, please be aware of that tonight that that will come at a later time um, but significant um, redevelopment of the commercial component which will add to a, a really quality development overall uh, we are looking again at a, a, a maximum uh, term of 26 years in the housing tiff district uh, the creation of this district and the approval of the plan has been accepted and approved and recommended tonight here by 
uh, the EDA on October 5th, as well as the Planning Commission on October 7th. Uh, so tonight, again, just one step in a couple different processes of just, again, establishing the district of the housing piece and then ultimately um, uh, accepting the, the redevelopment plan or the TIF plan. Uh, there are other steps, as I, as I noted, uh, we will be coming hopefully forward in early November with the master developer agreement. That outlines a lot of the specifics and it's also tying the housing TIF to the commercial redevelopment. Uh, so we're looking at really combining a lot of those uh, documents to make sure we're protecting the city's interest, uh, as well as a um, stormwater agreement, as well as a purchase agreement for a small triangle piece of city-owned right-of-way to the south of this uh, uh, greenfield parcel. So a lot of information tonight. I, I will say it's a very exciting project, north of $30 million of total investment. Uh, very, very significant. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I know our, our city attorney's office is here to answer questions, as well as Brian from Enclave as well. So thank you and be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. LaPointe. Um, I'll op open it up for questions. Uh, Council Member White, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Mayor. And I did have the opportunity to speak uh, and ask a few questions on at EDA, and I, I'm strongly supportive of this project. Um, that's an area that has needed some reinvestment. Um, you know, I, I just remember from talking to people door knocking and, you know, talking to people in that area that um, that's an old plaza and um, we've lost a lot of businesses there. So I think having the commercial investment is great, but to tie that in with um, addressing our need for more affordable housing options, um, I think is really is, is, a, is a really strong opportunity. And then, you know, having more people live right behind that plaza um, within walkable distance to all that retail will be good for the businesses and um, good for the residents. And so I think it's a great project. One of the things that um, I wanted to ask about, because I know this has come up in a few conversations, is, is this is a, you know, it's a, now we've tended to have, um, uh, do these for shorter lengths of time. And this is a 26 year, uh, uh, TIF, and um, in this case, it's um, one of the strong benefits I see to that, and I just wanted to confirm this, is that means that for those 26 years, too, that 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 those units of affordable housing, that that would be locked in for those 26 years, too, that we could sort of guarantee that that that, that would be available to people um, at in, in that more affordable range. And so I see this as a little different than some of the um, you know, in the past, we've done more tips on the commercial side, and this is a housing related one specifically, and it really will help us to make sure that for, for a number of years that we have, a, um, we've increased that pool of affordable housing. So I just wanted to have you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Council Member White. And um, yes, you're right, uh, that does kind of tie into um, maintaining that affordability for that duration. Um, again, there, there may be questions on the term of this, and yes, we are maximizing the term, but. Uh, we look at this much more holistically with the inclusion of the commercial redevelopment. Again, that's why we rely on uh, Baker Tilly as a, as a TIF consultant and really an expert in the field of running a lot of the numbers through the finance department. Uh, we felt that by maximizing that term uh, to really kind of lead way to some significant commercial redevelopment was uh, appropriate for this type of project. Thank you, Council Member White. Uh, see Council, Council Member Hendrickson, your hand is up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just um, want to thank Brian of Enclave. This is going to be a great project for Moorhead. Um, you know, it's the first exit when you come across the, the North Dakota border, you get off that first exit and see development of our commercial development and residential development. And uh, big fan, I'm a big supporter of this project. And um, you know, with the affordable housing too, that's a big that's a big part, and we, we need more of that in Moorhead. So, and, and you know, that's that's a great aspect of this project. So, um, just want to thank Brian and Enclave again. It's it's going to be wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Hendrickson. Um, are there any other uh, council members that wish to be heard on this matter? Council Member Lindos. Thank you, Mayor Judd. I was just going to echo what my other council members have already said. This is a great project, um, especially for that area. And I was going to then just move to take us out of um, public session. 
Before we do that, I just want to make sure, uh, Mr. Bachman, I, I, I do want to, before we do that, and just out of respect for Mr. Bachman, Council Mem Member Lendas, I think if he wishes to speak on this, I want to give him a couple mo moments yeah, too. Absolutely. So, absolutely. So, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Bachman, uh, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, again, as you I can hear, people are very excited about this innovative uh, project. So, do you wish to say a few words? I just wanted to be. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, sure, not a problem. Go right ahead. Thank you for being here. Yeah, no, we're um, we're very excited about the project. Um, I think it can be a, a a really super one for Moorhead. Um, we like the fact that we're able to try to get some housing in um, amongst the the retailers there because we only feel, um, as a couple of your council members have mentioned, that you know having um, having bodies in the area of retail is only going to help um, help uh, those those retailers with uh, kind of a built-in customer base, but it also, you know, provides a, a bit of a cool amenity for, for our tenants as well. Well, again, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you again for your uh, innovative concept. Uh, you know, I think this is going to be a game changer on that side of the interstate. So uh, greatly appreciate you you and your company investing in Moorhead and also send a special shout out to Mr. LaPointe and our city staff for being creative regarding this TIF. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. So thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I see now council member, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I wanted to echo that as well. Um, really appreciate Derek and the, and the city staff. Um, this has not been easy trying to um, get this recipe to work. Um, but uh, their creativity and their hard work has uh, really been appreciated on our part. Well, thank you everyone for your grace and working with each other. That's uh, great to hear. So uh, Council Member Lindos did make a motion to take us out of public hearing. Uh, so is there a second? Yeah, point seconds. Motion's made and seconded. Any further comments or discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist. Yes. Watson Curry. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Durand. Yes. White. Yes. Seljavold. Aye. Hendrickson. Aye. Lindos. Yes. Motion passes. We are out of, pub of public hearing, which brings us to 9A, the resolution to establish the redevelopment project in TIF district and approving the redevelopment plan and TIF plan for tax and grant financing housing in district number 29. Is there a motion to approve? This is Hendrickson, I so moved. Linda seconds. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Carlson? Yes. Watson Curry? Yes. Dahlquist? Yes. Durand? Yes. White? Yes. Lindos? Yes. Seljavold? Aye. Hendrickson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, folks. And item number 10 is a public hearing to consider actions related to 828 and 900 30th Avenue South. Is there a motion to take us back into public hearing? During so moves. Yep, white seconds. Motion's made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none. Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist. Yes. Watson Curry. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Durand. Yes. White. Yes. Seljavold. Aye. Hendrickson. Aye. Lindos. Yes. Motion passes. We are now in public hearing for item number 10. And Mr. LaPointe? Uh, Robin Houston uh, will we'll take this one. Okay, great. Ms. Houston, you are up. Oh, 
or if if she can't get on I, I can certainly do it real quick too okay no so worries. Uh, basically what you have before you as I just kind of scroll to uh, the page is we have a zoning change request uh, so we're working with a developer obviously uh, making sure that the project fits uh, it was zoned commercial uh, we are looking to rezone it to a mixed use uh, zoning district to allow for that housing but also create some flexibility for future uses as well as some of the um, uh, aligning with some of the setbacks and everything else that will come align with uh, parking parking ratios etc so this is a, a zoning and uh, uh, zone map uh, amendment to uh, go from general commercial to a mixed use zoning district okay for the properties that we just described in the TIF creation I should note no worries does this bring about any uh, questions or comments for Mr. LaPointe? All right, hearing none, is there a motion to, well, wait, before we go forward, are there any residents or any folks uh, that has been on the phone that wish to be heard on this matter? Okay, and I see, okay, thank you for that, Mr. Molly. So, Ms. Houston is here and available. So, Ms. Houston, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, did you want to make any comments regarding this item on public hearing number 10? I see that our mic is green, but we can't hear anything. Still having maybe some audio. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Miss Houston is in. We're just probably having some mic uh, issues. So. And I'll note oh, wait, too. There we go. Oh, she's, there we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. Wait. It, yep. We're here. <laughs> I was trying to use my fancy speakers, and apparently it must have shut off my mic. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All I, good. I apologize. No, I just wanted to mention that this process is a little out of the ordinary because we had to re-advertise the, um, the public hearing, and that is why it's a public hearing before you. And up to this point, we have not received any public comments um, either before the packet went out or before tonight's meeting. Um, there, the public hearing was advertised as usual, so I would just ask um, whoever's manning the phones to verify that nobody has called in to comment. And we're checking that right now. And other than that, we just need um, two separate motions, one on the rezoning and one on the uh, comprehensive plan amendment. Okay, just want to make sure so that we, these have to be separated. Okay, and then we did check uh, for the record. Uh, we have not received any phone and I believe e no email or, or electronic communications. And looking at the screen, I don't see any other callers that are here that have been announced for this item. So anyone else wish to be heard? Hearing none, then I'll ask for a motion to take us out of public hearing. I, Mr. Mayor, I had a question. Oh, there we go. Sorry. No worries, go right ahead. Councilmember <laughs> Watson Curry. Thank you. And perhaps um, it's possible I might have missed this in the last um, motion, actually, but I just was wondering um, with prevailing wages in these large projects, where does that come into play in, in some sort of an agreement? I know that's something that's come up with Home Builders Association is, is wanting clarity. Um, and securing those affordable housing units is really important and making sure the construction is, is fairly paid is also um, equally important. So just curious where that might fall in, if that's anything that we need to um, talk about. I'm going to defer to either Mr. LaPointe or Acting City Manager. Certainly. Tomorrow. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So um, th there are no federal funds in this project, so the Davis-Bacon wage rates, prevailing wages do not apply. But, um, you know, we typically uh, find that um, the trades here pay 
uh, more than the prevailing wages are um, currently when we're doing them. So um, we totally expect that uh, that uh, that everyone on the job in this project will be compensated fairly. Thank you, Mr. Molly. Uh, does that open up any other questions or comments from council? Thanks for the clarification. All right. So is there a motion to take us out of public hearing? Linda, some votes. No point seconds. Motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist? Yes. Watson Curry? Yes. Yeah. Carlson? Yes. Durand? Yes. White? Yes. Seljavold? Aye. Hendrickson? Aye. Lindos? Yes. Motion passes. So that brings us to 10A, which is the first reading of Ordinance 2020-11, an ordinance to rezone from RSC, residential commercial, to GEO, gateway overlay, to MU-3, commercial mixed use, GEO, gateway overlay. Is there a motion? I move to approve. Yeah, Linda seconds. Motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk. Dahlquist? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Watson Curry? Yes. White? Yes. Durand? Yes. Hendrickson? Aye. Seljavold? Aye. Lindas? Yes. Motion passes. 10B, resolution to approve amendment to the 2009 Comprehensive Plan Addendum Future Land Use Map from regional commercial to mixed use. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? Watson Curry still moved. Watson Curry second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone must have made the motion. I, I only heard I'll House Member. I, I didn't. Motion. Okay. All right. I can yeah. second that. This is Sarah. You got it, Madam City Clerk? Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dahlquist. Discussion. Oh, sorry. That's no, okay. Just want to make sure. All right. Yes. Dahlquist. Yes. Watson Curry. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Duran. Yes. White. Yes. Seljavold. Aye. Hendrickson. Aye. Lindos. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Ms. LaPointe. Thank you. And we'll move on to uh, item number 18, which is a snow and ice control briefing brought to you by Mr. Steve Moore. Thank you, Mayor, uh, City Council members. Uh, I will, this is kind of the same briefing I gave last year, and since I believe most or all of you are here, I have pared it down, so this should, uh, I'm gonna run through it relatively quickly and then leave some time for any Q&A if you, any, any of you have any questions. Um, is it delayed? I'm trying, I gotta be smarter than the remote here. Apparently that's not happening. Okay, there we go. This is what I'm gonna talk about. Are you gonna have to drive for me? Okay. Oh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, just our area of responsibility, just a reminder, is about 550 lane miles, and uh, new this year is, uh, we, we, we uh, went up to 48 miles of bike and pedestrian paths and sidewalks. That's the great news. Um, that we're making those kinds of advancements in our trail system. And uh, just those pie charts are a breakdown of the functional class um, uh, where 71% is local roads and then minor and arterial and collectors and the surface type. Primarily asphalt roads we're dealing with. Next slide, please. 
Our preparation for this year, like we do every year, I'm in the final stages of making some changes to the snow and ice control plan that was published last year uh, for the first time, and uh, I'm tweaking that a little bit, and you'll all get a copy of that and with a summary of changes. Uh, nothing, uh, the biggest thing is uh, a paring down of what we can do uh, on a 24-hour rotation. I was, we uh, had a couple of large events where we showed that we couldn't truly fully operate 24 hours um, because we just don't have the resources to do that. So I'm gonna tweak it a little bit where we can uh, maybe break off and still cover some of the primary roads uh, continuously if we need to, if we get a massive event, some of those big events that we got last year. Uh, we got all of our equipment inspected, prepared, calibrated, and our ice control materials have been purchased. We're in the process of updating our road maps, and we uh, had our meeting to go over the changes to those maps. And then next week, we're gonna be training my primary operators on the 29th of October, like we did last year. And then a uh, new this year is on the 5th of October, we're gonna be training some wastewater employees as additional augmentees to our snow removal force. Next slide, please. And uh, under the concept of operations, our manpower, we have 16 manpower positions that are dedicated uh, during snow and ice control season. And under optimal conditions, we wanna run 15 of those. Uh, we rarely get there though due to uh, um, illness and vacations and things like that. But we do limit vacations uh, if they're not long range plan vacations when we have snow events coming so we can maximize our capabilities. Additional augmentees, uh, parks maintenance, forestry and fleet maintenance, we pull from those, those areas. So sometimes uh, those services offered under parks maintenance and forestry are impacted if we have to augment with those individuals. And again, like I mentioned before, we're adding wastewater. So I'm very appreciative to Bob Zimmerman for ponying up some folks that we're gonna get trained to have because we do have concerns um, and we're doing contingency planning for COVID impacts for snow and ice removal. So we know that mission, uh, two missions in public works that cannot wait. And that's one is snow and ice removal in the winter and it's sanitation. So uh, we have contingency plans for manning those functions and worst case scenario, we would stop all other primary functions and dedicate our forces to the, those two mission sets. Next slide, please. Continuing, um, during snow and ice events, we have four phases of operation, the anti-ice phase, uh, the phase one, which is our primary and secondary routes. Phase three is the remaining citywide plowing and then our steady state and routine maintenance is phase three on daily maintenance routes. Next slide. The anti-ice phase, uh, this is, uh, we'll continue to do this. The, there's a, a little map there that shows that's most of our primary and secondary routes on if we have the right conditions that's surface temperature air temperature wind speed um, and precipitation we will anti ice in most when we can because what does that do it prevents that snow from freezing and bonding to the pavement so we're able to get more of that off when we do our plowing so anti icing is very cost effective and uh, improves our service levels for our operations. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into great detail. Phase one is basically primary and secondary routes. Um, if we get predictions of snow in excess of a couple of inches, we're gonna run those routes, and, um, and th that's our priority. While we're running plows, we also run salt trucks or sand trucks, depending on temperature of the pavement surface. Our primary means for ice control is salt. If it gets too cold, then we'll move to a salt sand mix or just plain sand. Next slide. Phase two, after the snow stops, that's the key point here. Uh, we don't start plowing the residential areas until after it stops. So if we have a 18 hour snow event, it's gonna, we're gonna be starting those operations uh, at that 18 hour point. Um, so that, that causes, if, if we get a large snowstorm, then it's gonna be a long wait for some folks that, to get out of their neighborhoods. Um, when we plan to do the phase two, is typically between midnight and 4 a.m., but it all depends on the end of the, the snow event. And we break off into 10 zones. Good news is, is um, 
this year, we were able to create that full-time compost site position, and now that person will be a truck driver, an additional truck driver for our snow and ice control operations, which means zone six, which are our friends and businesses in the old industrial complex will now get a dedicated resource rather than having to wait for another zone to get in there. So that's been something we've been wanting to do because those businesses deserve uh, an increased level of service. So we're gonna um, make that change this year. So we're excited about that. Next slide, please. And citywide plowing will we'll take um, 10 to 14 hours. And um, we, we don't use a lot of ice control material. We don't use ice control materials in residential streets. Uh, we do at the intersections when those residential streets intersect primary and secondary roads as folks uh, stop and around school areas for buses and parents dropping off and picking up kids. Next slide, please. And next slide. Um, one thing I would like to add in here is uh, just ask the public is if at all possible during a major snow, during a snow event, please uh, do all you can to not park on the streets. Uh, we know parking is allowed uh, on our streets, but it, it really makes it difficult and we get a better um, result the fewer cars we have on the streets. And I know I realize not everybody can park in the driveway, but if you could make that uh, attempt that we would certainly appreciate it. Um, because we won't come back and plow streets until your maintenance day if there's cars there. So we, you know, we could be sweeping around a car and so that leaves a big ridge in the middle of the road and we'll come back during your street maintenance day. Next slide, please. Another part of our snow removal is on the parks maintenance side, that 48 miles of bike paths and the city maintained sidewalks. We got six full-time folks and usually one to two seasonal that do that mission. Um, and we do that typically during the scheduled work day after the snow event. So um, if it ends you know, in the afternoon, uh, we will start the following day at 7 a.m. And typically we can clear all those bike paths and sidewalks within a 24 hour period. Where it may be delayed is if we have to augment my street crews with those park maintenance resources, and then it may take us a little bit longer. And as well, if we get large snow events where we have to actually use blowers versus plows and brooms, it takes longer as well. And then when all that's done, then we'll hit the outdoor skating rinks and cross country ski trail grooming. So those are our two lowest priorities. Next slide, please. Then phase three is our daily maintenance routes. Those are plowed Monday through Friday, and, and those areas are signed uh, for that. Sometimes they don't co do not coincide with your garbage day because the garbage routes take different times with different resources, so they don't always line up. For example, I live in Horizon Shores, and my garbage day is Thursday, and my maintenance day is Tuesday. So. Um, just make sure you don't you know those days and if you're not sure when your maintenance day is please call us at public works and we'll be happy to look at that up for you and um, during those maintenance routes we also continue to run salt and sand operations on our primary and secondary routes depending on uh, temperatures and conditions and then we also start establishing wind rows along the perimeter of the city to uh, help us with the blowing snow and in extreme cases we will be blowing and hauling snow uh, like we have done uh, the last two years. Next slide. And then every major event, I do a situation report or a sit rep and that is sent to the city manager and then is ultimately sent to you all. So you know what we did and what we accomplished during that time frame. Also any limb facts or limiting factors that may have occurred during those operations, such as equipment outages or manpower shortfalls that may have led to a longer uh, plow event than we plan or anticipate. One thing I won't be doing is this year is making a prediction of exactly how long it's gonna take. I did that a couple times last year and um, sometimes it's just impossible to determine and I don't wanna set up ourselves up for failure uh, when, when I say 16 hours and it takes 24 because of unseen circumstances or the event is way worse than we anticipated. So I'll be using general terms and what I think, but I'm not gonna be putting hard times on uh, because quite honestly, it's hard to do. Um, if I have a good grasp of it and it's a standard four to you know four inch, five inch event, I'm co confident to say 10 to 12 hours and we'll be good. But any of those major storms that are six, seven, eight, plus 
I, I'm going to probably long ball that and just say we're going to work it as quickly as possible and I'll provide periodic updates on how the plow operations are progressing. And next slide, and that's my last one. So I left a lot of detail out because most of you know the, the scoop and I just thank you for your support prior to this and during the snow removal season. Thanks Mayor Judd for riding around with one of my drivers last year. Um, and we'll offer that up to you again this year and any other council member who would like to ride along and uh, see what the fight looks like from the field. So with that, I'll, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for all your work and I will take you up on that uh, invitation. It was rather enjoyable last year. However, yeah, eight o'clock came too early to go back to work, but <laughs> it was great and I'll do it again. Uh, council member White, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Moore, I just wanted to say thank you so much to you and your staff. We're, we are so fortunate to have, have all of the great folks that are working with you on this. And I hope that this winter is a little easier than last year, although uh, this week is not starting off so great. Um, my, I, actually, what I wanted to ask you a little bit about is um, our trails. And, and I'm glad you, you talked a little bit about the policy that you have for making sure that the bike and pedestrian paths are are cleared and at, and maybe this is more for the city manager i wonder if we wanted to um just do a little more to get the word out about that i think this year in particular when there are just far fewer options for people to get some exercise indoors anything that we can do to let them know that um we're still maintaining our bike and pedestrian paths in the winter uh, i think that would be good and i also wondered about those do we have um a sense of like our which ones are uh, have lighting on them in the evening so i was thinking about you know there's some that are close to the road but others that are not like i was thinking about the new one that we put in last year up to the burquist cabin it's very nice along the river and um, but i don't know that we have lighting in, in that area when we have such short days um, if we had a sense of even if we're out advertising and you know sharing information about some of these paths, if we could share that too to let them know which ones are also accessible even um, in the early morning and in the evening. Yes, typical, yeah, we could we could look into that, uh, Council Member White, um, but just in a nutshell, if uh, it's a bike paths adjacent to a street, and then those will be lit by those street lights, but um, the bike paths that are not, that are along the river corridor are not lit, um, and but, like around my Horizon Shores Pond, those are lit as well. So that's a good idea. We'll, we can uh, break that down on which ones are lit uh, for winter. Say, uh, and th thank you, Council Member White, for bringing up the idea of outdoor activations um, with uh, bars and restaurants being able to be at 50% capacity and people wanting to maintain space. We, the parks crew actually met this morning. We are actively searching for and planning some new and um, creative ways to figure out what outdoor activation might look like. We invite the community. We don't need to wait for the city of Moorhead to do that, to have their own ideas and get fun things set up uh, to do outside, taking care of trails and and, uh, and these fun activities. Um, you know, as uh, Steve Moore was talking about here, uh, this comes down to our essential functions. I mean, at its core, it doesn't get more essential than snow and ice removal and sanitation. I mean, this is up there with wastewater and public safety. And so thanks for all you do to do the both of those the same is really pretty incredible. I wanted to let everybody know we are looking at things as a team a little differently this year. Um, you know, in the past, as you know, when we face these emergencies, we, we, um, we, we, we tackle them together, whether it's a flood emergency or any site of sort of emergency. Um, one thing that happens in the public works world is when it's a snow emergency, and these are these big snows at eight, 10, 12 inches, um, these folks are on their own. <laughs> and they're expected to move, I mean, tens if not hundreds of thousands of pounds of tons of snow. Um, in the course of 24 hours. So what we're all trying to do, you, you mentioned Bob Zimmerman uh, making wastewater staff available and uh, we have community development, we have others coming together so that we can all work together to, um, to, uh, to, to deal with these snow emergencies. Um, 
uh, uh, Council Member Carlson brought a fun idea around adopting a hydrant the other day. We've got our, our fire crew and emergency crew looking at that so that we can help clear those out. Um, later in the season when it gets icy, we gotta, we gotta clear out um, storm drains, people getting out there with their ice picks and making water, water work so we're all working together. This is all part of a team. We got our city staff, we've got our residents, um, and, uh, and all of us uh, working to, get, to be there for each other to get through the winter. So. Thanks for all you guys do, Steve. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. And then I'll, uh, oops, sorry. Councilmember Watson Curry, your hand is up. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a quick joke is I happened to share a driveway with my neighbor, and when I was first elected, they were very excited, thinking that that meant we got free snow removal of our driveway, and they were very. <laughs> very disappointed and they learned that just like the rest of the city staff uh, we don't get preferential treatment and we're also digging in with you so <laughs> um i was really glad to hear um so thanks to bob zimmerman's team for um pitching in as well that's great news and of course we wish um the team good health and um i'm glad to hear that you have no surprise but i'm glad to hear that you have contingency plans for um, COVID. Uh, one question that, a perennial question that always comes up is um, private spaces, businesses, for example, um, making sure that walkways and sidewalks are accessible. Um, is there a way we could streamline communication? Um, I live on the north side and I know often the north and south um, connections, particularly that have to cross a number of railroad tracks, can be a bit treacherous. Um, so really, are there creative ways we could engage with our business community um, and residents to make sure that those walkways are, are clear? So just throwing that out there. Um, I know there's always, as Dan was saying, it's everyone's out there alone, but um, making sure people can uh, get out and about and do so safely. Yes. So any creative suggestions or ways we want to communicate, I would appreciate that. Okay. And thanks for the work. Thank you. Those are, those are good ideas. And I always take the picture of my ridge in front of my driveway during the first push, um, with, and I make my wife stand behind it for scale, so. <laughs> any other uh, questions or comments from council? No, thank you, uh, Mr. Moran, thank you for your staff. And, and I guess I'm just gonna close the conversation unless someone else has anything to say is that, folks, the key word moving forward is just grace. Um, you know, we have a plan. Uh, Mr. Moore has worked. We're working with city staff to put together a really good plan uh, to, to serve folks. Uh, but again, sometimes we have to pivot. Uh, the staff has to pivot uh, when things come up that we're not anticipating. So just exercise some grace uh, if you're calling and if there's a street that was missed feel free to give a call, let us know. Uh, we, we will follow through and make sure that it's taken care of. So we do have great customer service here. It's just a matter of we can't solve the problem if we don't know about it, and let's just exercise some grace as you're communicating the uh, problem uh, with our staff. So again, Mr. Moore, thank you very much for all you and your staff do. Thank you, and before, I'd like to just shout out to my operations division manager, Randy Affield, who works long, countless hours from home coordinating these behind the scenes events. Um, I couldn't do it without him, so I'd like to thank him publicly for that. So Randy Affield is, uh, I couldn't do my job without him. And then I have two of the best crew chiefs, Blake Hoganson and Dave DeLong, who are my frontline NCOs, I would call them in the military, getting the job done where the boots hit the ground. So those, uh, and, and then my guys uh, that are out there each and every day doing the work. So uh, we got, and we have everybody back we had last year, which is the first time in my tenure that that's happened, which is good because maybe retention uh, leads to uh, hopefully a sign of, of better morale and that we're giving them the resources and the tools they need to uh, work effectively out there. So um, that's good news. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Hi, right, folks. That moves us to uh, agenda item number 19, which is a resolution to adopt the MAP Bus Transit Authority study. And if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Uh, Lori Van Beek is going to introduce that item. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, thank you for being here tonight. 
Good. Well, thanks for having me. So um, this item is the adoption of the Manit Bus Transit Authority study. Um, the study uh, was brought to council back in September, um, and a presentation was made by Michael Maddox of the Metrocog. Um, and so we wanted to give an opportunity for council to be able to look at the full study and to watch the webinar if they chose to and also provide the executive summary of this document since it's quite lengthy and um, has a lot of information in it about the future, future of public transit for the metropolitan area. Um, we, uh, Michael Maddox is here uh, on the, the call as well if we need to, to uh, use him for some answering for some questions. Uh, basically, the, the study is a, is being provided as a tool, our, our guide, to um, look at the future of transit in our organization and decision making. And the recommendations um, have uh, both interim and long-term recommendations in there. And um, as they are selected to be implemented or looked at deeper, there would be they'd be coming back to the council for funding if there's any funding needed for those for those recommendations. Uh, the purpose of the study was because we are a growing metro area and that um, we expect with the 2020 census data that our population will exceed 200,000, um, making us a large urban system or a, um, a transportation management area, which changes some of our federal funding and our reporting requirements. So a lot of the study was about um, how that would affect our funding, um, possible streams of funding to supplement that, and the additional reporting and um, organizational structure, removing duplicate positions between Fargo, Moorhead, and uh, streamlining the staffing and things like that. Um, the interim recommendation I want to mention is uh, for the creation of a position through the Metropolitan Council of Governments um, of a transit director that would lead the implementation of the transit authority and do all of the, the strategic planning, the agreements, um, that need to be done in order to form a transit authority. Um, the long-term recommendation then would be to create a North Dakota transit authority with um, expansion to the Minnesota side in the future. Um, how that would affect Moorhead um, specifically is if a transit authority is created, Moorhead and Dilworth would be a purchasing bus service from the transit authority for the metro area, as with West Fargo and um, you know other other cities and, and counties potentially in the metro area, and um, we would still be a grantee to the state of Minnesota and um, have federal grant uh, requirements as well, um, and then Moorhead would have representation on the authority board, uh, but that's that's what the two recommendations are in term and long term. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, and Michael Maddox as well. Say, Council Member Hendrickson, the mayor, mayor had to step out Temporarily, do you mind taking over the meeting? I don't see any hands up, but we run it for, for a moment. Yeah, I can. Thank um, you. Let me get my agenda up here. Sorry, Dan. I just exited out of my agenda as soon as you told me. Me just a second here. Excuse me, Dad, you said you didn't see any hands up? There are no hands up. Okay, it's it's loading right now. Good, and uh, the resolution is to adopt the MAT Bus Transit Authority study. Okay, can I get a motion to adopt the study? Lindos moves it um, to 
adopt the MAP bus transit authority study. Watson Curry. Okay. So we got a motion by Linda and a second by Watson Curry. All in favor say aye. Oh, we can't do that. We'll get a roll call vote. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dahlquist? Yes. Watson Curry? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Durand? Yep. White? Yes. Seljevold? Aye. Hendrickson? Yes. Lindos? Yes. Motion okay. passes. Yeah. Thanks, JJ. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for covering. Appreciate it. I shut my, I shut my uh, agenda down as soon as, yeah, so sorry about that. But anyways. No worries. Hey, as long as it passed. <laughs> We're good. All right. So we'll go to uh, item number 21. And thank you, Council Member Hendrickson, for covering for me. Uh, 2020 legislative update. I believe that's uh, Miss Lisa Bodie, right? That, that is right. Thank you very much, Mayor Judd. I wanted, I'm not gonna take too much of your time tonight, but I think it's, it's a good moment to reflect. Um, since the city council last met, the legislature uh, held its fifth special session of the 2020 strangest legislative <laughs> session ever. And um, as a result, Moorhead fared very, very well in the uh, state's capital investment bill, um, resulting in several bonding initiatives that were high priority of the city of Moorhead, including an award for the Clay County Solid Waste uh, Management Campus. So that project will break ground as soon as weather allows. I don't think it'll be yet in 2020, but um, I know it's a shovel ready project. So as soon as possible, I, that one will get going. And another huge win for the city of Moorhead is the is funding through the MnDOT um, appropriation for rail safety. Uh, $62 million for a railroad underpass for our downtown. And um, I know those of you that were on the city council uh, back when we broke ground for the 20th, 21st Street underpass, we um, touted that project as the largest public construction project in Moorhead's history and we'll be topping that one with this project. So it's really a phenomenal investment in Moorhead. Um, everybody's really, really excited about that. Um, and then also we made some project on our flood mitigation efforts. We had requested $22 million, $22.5 million for flood control in 2020. Uh, the amount appropriated statewide was $17 million. So we are falling short of what we had hoped for in that specific area. Um, Dr. Zimmerman has already been in touch with, with Minnesota DNR about how much Moorhead's portion will be and trying to stretch that as far as we can with um, option agreements that we have pending with property owners whose properties we will be purchasing in order to extend our um, you know, flood protection efforts in largely in North Moorhead, I believe. And we did not get funding for the community and aquatic center, but I think we can say it was a pretty successful bonding bill for Moorhead. Um, really, if you stop and if you pause and think about it, the amount appropriated to Moorhead was almost 5% of the state's bonding bill, which is a pretty good share for Moorhead. So really excited about it. Now the local work begins. There's still much to do, and uh, but it can't uh, go without stop pausing and celebrating these major milestones, thanking our local legislators and the city council for their support. And it's a, it's, 
it's a great, great result for Moorhead. So thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And thank you, Ms. Bodie, for all of your work and your research and your time and your team uh, working here internally, but also with our lobbyists in uh, St. Paul for all the work that uh, you all have done. I mean, this obviously, uh, you know, the, the vision that the residents had and, and, and the uh, current or the current and former council have had for these projects uh, started with a dream and uh, obviously through your hard work and perseverance and resilience, uh, you made it a reality. So thank you for your work. Um, greatly appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate that. It is a team effort and I stand on the shoulders of those that came before me. So I appreciate the, the praise very much, but I share it with others. Thank you. Likewise, I definitely hear you there. Uh, Councilmember Member Hendrickson, your hand is up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank uh, Lisa and all of her hard work, uh, city staff. You know, we did get the transfer station in there, so that's a huge plus for, for the Clay County and Moorhead. But I especially want to thank uh, Senator Eakin and Representative Lean and uh, Representative Mark Marquardt. They did a lot of work to get all this funding secured, and we've been looking at this ever since I've been on the council. So, uh, great job. It's great for Moorhead and uh, Senator, or not Senator, Representative Lean. Um, Thank you so much for your service to the Clay County and to Moorhead, and you will be missed, my friend. Thanks. Great words, Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, any other Council Member wish to be heard on this uh, item? I, I just wish we could happy dance together. It's hard to be apart with this good news. <laughs> Um, to, to Council Member Hendrickson's point about Representative Lee and, and, and completing his term, we do have plans to uh, honor him uh, in November uh, at, at a council meeting. So we're very excited about the opportunity to celebrate with him his accomplishments for Moorhead the, these past eight years. Thank you for sharing that, Ms. Bodie. You know, I think that's probably appropriate. Uh, I know Council Member Lean has, uh, I'm sorry, Representative Lean um, has uh, been really instrumental in getting a lot of projects here and, and resources. So uh, very, very much appropriate. Any other uh, person wish to be he uh, heard on this exciting, but yet uh, different year? <laughs> All right. Well, again, uh, thank you again, Ms. Bodie, for all of your work. It's greatly appreciated, and your team. Have a good night. All right, folks, I think that brings us to agenda item number 23, which is uh, mayor and council reports. Is there any council members wish to give a report or an update? We'll go with council member White. Your hand is up. Thanks, I must be the quickest one tonight. So I have two items. One, I just wanted to remind uh, people that we are currently accepting applications for our 2020 Human Rights Awards, and those are due by November 4th. So if you know of individuals or organizations in Moorhead that are doing human rights work around the areas of either workplace, education, civic and community, nonprofit, or youth, um, please nominate them or um, encourage uh, others to nominate. Um, but that deadline is coming up on November 4th and we will be honoring those individuals and organizations later in the year. And I also just wanted to take a minute to thank um, first Mayor Judd for his participation. If, you, if those of you are not aware that um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and you may have noticed our, our always Dapper mayor, but um, particularly tonight in his pink shirt because he is participating in Real Men Wear Pink. And um, I wanted to thank him for that as somebody who was directly impacted by breast cancer in my family. Um, I appreciate that. And I also wanted to thank our Moorhead police officers who are also fundraising. And so if you notice one of our officers, any of our officers wearing a pink badge, that's part of their effort to raise funds um, to help eradicate breast cancer. So I want to thank them as well for for their efforts to, um, to help address this issue. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member White. And I wanna send, before I pass it over to Council Member Lindas, uh, 
your spouse is also participating in the uh, Real Men Wear Pink. So uh, greatly appreciate his efforts as well. Thank you. It's a friendly competition, all for a good cause. Absolutely. <laughs> Council Member Lindos. Uh, thank you, Mary Judd. Um, some of us don't have pink, so we're, 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 we're pink challenge, okay? Um, I'm, I'm up for donations. Um, uh, I was going to say there, there's another huge happy dance, but I, I think um, Council Member Hendrickson is probably going to talk about the NPS. Um, uh, but I wanted to um, have two things, which is one, uh, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Um, I'm actually going to be on the Environment and Energy Policy Subcommittee. Um, of that and they're meeting um, in November 5th if I have it right on my calendar. So that's coming up. Um, and so if there's items like that that people want to, to um, give me to bring forth, I, I'm, I'm very open to that. Um, the other thing is um, going along with our first presentation we had at the very beginning, um, along with Noelle um, uh, Hardin, John Hopkins University um, has, has been running a community of practice that Noelle and I have been participating in we're just at the end of that six month process and that community practice has been developing a toolkit to help cities um, with food system planning um, and to essentially make um, food systems more resilient in the face of outside events um, such as the pandemic uh, or even floods and other, other items. And so we've been participating along with Orlando, Austin, Denver and Baltimore and so it's been really eye-opening, um, and out of this, the toolkit that's getting developed, I think, is going to be very useful for a lot of um, cities, not just ourselves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lindas. Uh, Councilmember Watson Curry, your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I apologize, I did miss the last meeting. That was only the third meeting I've missed in my turn. Um, and so I uh, didn't get to say just my gratitude and thanks for um, participation in the day. Um, I know uh, Acting City Manager Dan, will, Dan Mulley will talk about um, our core functions of pop, you know, removing snow and flushing the toilet, all those things. But I think the heart of our community is really um, honoring and respecting its diversity and challenges within that. So um, just wanted to express my gratitude and um, was really moved to participate virtually in some of those things. Um, also, I wanted to note too, if there were, uh, I could bring this up in news, new business, but for the next calendar year, um, when we set meeting schedule, um, Council Member Hendrickson, I think I hear your keyboard. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, it, if we could earmark Indigenous Peoples Day um, uh, to hold our council to hold the council meeting on the following day on Tuesday, as was requested, I would love to see that happen for the subsequent year. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, the Pangea is happening this year, and they are also, of course, celebrating virtually. And you can find on. Um, their website on the Historical Cultural Society of Clay County, you can find uh, information to submit a digital application. So um, I think that that is on Friday. So that's coming up pretty quickly for folks. And uh, as this is my last council member prior to, or council meeting prior to our 2020 election, I would be remiss if I did not put our city clerk on the spot and say, Christina Rust, is there anything that we citizens of Moorhead need to know um, about upcoming election? Obviously, um, early voting has started. Um, and this Saturday, there is it is open at, um, uh, at the courthouse as well. So I'm going to volley it over to you if there's anything else additional that we need to know and just express our gratitude for our, um, all of the work being done on our polling sites and um, with our voting judges. So so there you go, Christina Rust, one more chance. What do we got going on for election day? <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Council Member Watson Curry. You know, honestly, people have really stepped up. We um, met capacity sort of for our election judges about two weeks ago, which is so great. So thank you to everybody who um, stepped up and just um, 
are going to be helping out for that. Um, I think I will just play off of what the mayor said earlier. I, I think that the thing to remember on election day this year, and especially because of COVID, um, is, is just practicing grace with people. Um, I, I think that's the greatest kind of tidbit of information that everyone needs and put it in your pocket and remember that day. And um, yeah, I'm excited for it to get here. Um, I will be happy when it's over. <laughs> well, Thank you, and that's all I have for my report. So thanks for letting me yeah. pester everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we do appreciate all the work that you've been putting in, uh, Madam City Clerk. I, I, I know it is uh, busy at this time of year and pretty stressful on top of all the other things that you have going on, but we really appreciate it. Any other council member want to add anything uh, as far as reports for the good of the order? Okay. Then I'll be uh, brief uh, bullet points here real quick. Uh, a big thank you to uh, Governor Walls and uh, Commissioner Jan Malcolm from the Minnesota Department of Health for getting a saliva testing site <clears throat> here in our city. It's up and running, 1110 14th Street South uh, in Moorhead. Uh, come one, come all. Uh, right now, I, I believe uh, there are some folks that I had heard went through it today. It is pretty smooth, quick, efficient to get you through. Uh, so that is now open to Minnesotans and North Dakotans. Uh, so uh, if anyone has any concerns about their health, feel free to stop in there. Also want to send a special thank you uh, to Park Christian School President uh, Chris Nellermo for his invitation to go take a tour of the school. Now that the renovations are completed, it is completely beautiful. I uh, appreciate them uh, increasing their uh, footprint here in our city. Also, a uh, congratulations to Solutions uh, down in South Moorhead on uh, 30th Avenue regarding the groundbreaking uh, events that took place uh, uh, last week. Again, as we're going into this time of year, and especially with COVID, where mental health uh, will be a concern. We're grateful uh, for solutions being a part of our city and also providing uh, services for folks that may be going through some things uh, at, at this time. Also, uh, thank you to city staff, uh, Chris Radai, and uh, other staff uh, for uh, putting on the virtual coffee with the mayor. Uh, last week, uh, we're looking at uh, obviously keeping that going throughout, uh, I guess, into the next year. And uh, we'll be going to, I'm not sure which is our next award. Four. four. Okay, we'll be going to Ward Four. So it will be virtual. I Coffee or tea, um, everyone is welcome. Also, two things I want to bring up real quickly. One, thank you for Council Member White for the breast cancer. Um, Awareness Month, shout out, and the real men wear pink. Uh, I lost uh, two, two grandparents, two grandmothers to uh, breast cancer, so it's something that is uh, really uh, personal to me. So uh, anything that we can do to increase the awareness, uh, that would be good. So uh, a special shout out to the American Cancer, uh, cancer Society and uh, Hannah, and I'm gonna butcher her last name, Letexier. Uh, for inviting me to be a part of that uh, project. And my apologies if I butchered your last name, Hannah. Uh, lastly, uh, October is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, again, as we're looking at taking care of ourselves as a city and our families, uh, this is also something that will be, I think, discussed quite a bit. Uh, I uh, will be issuing a proclamation tomorrow and I think that will take place at the Yemcomp Center. Looking at my calendar at 2.30 uh, to talk about uh, domestic violence and the awareness and how we have to look at each other and take care of ourselves and our families as we all will be going into a very stressful time uh, into this winter. Uh, also, I will be speaking on the 30th at the Rape and Abuse Crisis Center Harvest Fling event as well, uh, briefly uh, to share some experiences as it relates to that. So again, uh, just folks, uh, 
let's try to take care of ourselves. We know this is a very stressful time of year. Uh, again, the, the theme is going to be grace and, uh, and trying to take care of ourselves and our neighbors and our families. So with that, I will pass over to Mr. Molly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see here. So the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce has announced a new president and CEO, Sharon Full, Shannon Full, I'm sorry. Um, and so she brings 20 years of experience. And what's interesting is she's coming here from the Twin West Chamber in Plymouth, Minnesota. So she has experience um, in the state of Minnesota. So we have had, I have not had a chance to meet Shannon yet, but she'll be here soon. We want to welcome her. And um, also thank Vice President Jim Parsons and past Chair Tom Dawson and, and current Chair Sandy Pietz for their leadership over the past year. It's been hard since uh, uh, Craig Whitney passed away last December. So um, we mentioned the 2020 election, which is coming up in, on, in November 3rd, next Tuesday. So um, I just, I can't help but say that the, the people of the election judges and the folks of the county and all of our, uh, the folks that are working together to make this a safe, fair, and accessible election have been nothing less than inspiring. So thank you all. Um, the, um, there's just this really incredible thing that's happening in Moorhead uh, right now um, related to uh, a vote uh, at the, the Moorhead Public Service Commission last week. And um, that relates to um, the city of Moorhead and its utility being 100% carbon free starting January 1st, 2021. So um, that just, it's just so, so intense, <laughs> the level of thought leadership. <laughs> in the state of Minnesota and the nation to be able to say something like that. Um, so a lot of credit goes out to the, to the people that great, own this great utility and the folks that are helping run it. And uh, it's a very exciting time. And uh, uh, really, I think there'll be many others as we kind of grow and develop in how we, how we, uh, how we use our energy um, and find better ways to do it uh, to be guided like this. So way to go, Moorhead, for being leaders in this, in this realm. So. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Molly, for your work and for MPS, uh, again, for having that uh, vision and being innovative. Uh, before we move forward, uh, and I apologize in advance, uh, Council Mem Member Hendrickson, is that an old hand or a new hand? No, that's a new one, Mr. Mayor. Um, and Dan, Dan just explained what happened, but we did, um, MPS did pass that resolution to become 100% carbon free at the October 20th election, or 20th mission meeting. And I have a, and you know, it's going to help us move forward with our Green City Step initiatives, too. So it's a great thing. And like Dan said, we are a leader in the state of Minnesota for renewable energy and sustainability. So uh, kudos to the MPS Commission. Thanks. Yes, I'll definitely second that. Thank you, Council Member Hendrickson. All right, folks, then that takes us to uh, item number 25 on the agenda, which is an executive session, 25A. That's fine. Oh, oh, it's back up now. Okay. All right, keep you guys waiting like that. You're so you're such good people. All right. Council City Clerk, we're ready. All right. It's 8:44 p.m. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Good night, Morehead. Morehead proud. <laughs>